Okay, we're on to the phylum platyhelminthes. So this means flat, like platypus. Helminth actually means worm. So these are the flat worms. The flatworms are triploblastic. Meaning they have all three tissue layers. However, they do not have a body cavity. And so they are said to be acelomates. They are solid tissue. So if I look at this diagram here, you can see that they have a digestive system that is running through their body, but there is not a space within that digest where that digestive system resides. So it's solid tissue. This is probably why it is important for them to be flat, one of the reasons, because this digestive system, food comes in, it diffuses through the digestive system and into the tissues. And so the entire organism is pretty much close to its digestive tract because that is how nutrients get to the cells. It has no circulatory system. It also has no um, uh, respiratory system. So uh, when we look at this organism, oxygen just diffuses across the surface of its body Another reason why being flat is good because it has a lot of surface area and carbon dioxide diffuses out. Okay, so it also being solid, um, there's no spaces that the nutrients and the gases can't get to, right? So they can diffuse right across because it's a solid surface. We also see that this organism is bilaterally symmetric. So we have bilateral symmetry. And this means that we now have cephalization. So we have a brain. These two things go hand in hand. If I am bilaterally symmetric, I tend to move through my environment in one direction and my head tends to go first. We are weird in that we stand upright, but as think about a cat or a dog, their head is entering the environment first. Sometimes, you know, parts of your body can enter the environment first when we're standing upright. But anyway, that helps to be protective, right? All your nervous system, sensory systems, close to entering the new environment. Okay, so that is cephalization. Notice that they have a brain and that these structures, the eye spots, and they also have these little ear-like structures, which actually detect chemicals, um, allows them to navigate to their food. These are, this is an example of a planarian and it is free living. So we're gonna say, this is my free living. Planarian. It is actually a scavenger. So we have these, for example, in rivers and streams. It would be eating off of dead debris. It is a scavenger. Also notice that it does not have a mouth up near its head. Its mouth is down here near the center of its body. And um, it is um, has an incomplete digestive tract because it does not have an anus. So it has no, right, no second opening. So no, actually, we'll just put it has a mouth anus because that's what it is, right? So actually, I'll just write, won't leave anything on there. So this pharynx is kind of interesting. When you watch these guys feed, they can actually extend their pharynx almost like a, I think of it kind of looks like a vacuum cleaner hose and they just suck stuff up into their gastrovascular cavity. Um, we'll talk about these nephridia or the proto-nephridia. This is their excretory system. This is how they get rid of nitrogenous wastes like um, urea or ammonia comes out through there. And they do have an anterior and a posterior end now, and a dorsal surface and a ventral surface. Those are characteristics that you only find 
in or descriptions that you only find in organisms that are bilaterally symmetric. Now I said that these guys are free living because most of the species within this group are not free living. They are endoparasites. So this is versus ectoparasites. meaning that the parasites live inside their host. That's a D, inside the host. So we can talk about one of the reasons why these parasites, one of the reasons why these parasites um, are, um, why this group has so many parasites. So we could talk about, you know, some of the reasons for this. Um, one is, is that they are dorsal ventrally flattened, right? So they can absorb, in some instances, absorb nutrients right across the surface of their body in, in the case of tapeworms. So tapeworms, let's talk about tapeworms. These are falsely segmented. They're not truly segmented. So they are not truly segmented because they actually are very strange. They, they actually, each of their segments has its own reproductive system, an ovary and a testes. And so it's almost like they're budding or they're cloning themselves to get longer. And so what we have is an end, the head end, but it's not really a brain and it, there's no mouth. This is called the scolex. And it has these suckers and hooks that come off of it. So this is my scolex of my tapeworm. Then we have a segment. Oh, man. We have a segment that looks like this. And as we move down, these segments actually get bigger. And I'm just going to, like, not draw them all. Until at the very end, we have these big segments like this. OK. These segments are called proglottids. The proglottids are capable of producing egg and sperm. Interestingly, the sperm can leave one segment, go into another segment, and fertilize the eggs. So they can have self-fertilization. If there happen to be two tapeworms, in your digestive system, I would imagine that they could have cross fertilization. That seems weird, but it could happen, right? Because the sperm are actually released and then they travel and then pass back into another segment. The ending segments actually leave the host via the feces and they are said to be uh, grabbed. And there's rabid proglottids. And these are filled with fertilized eggs. Okay. I had to put eggs up there. I didn't want to go to the next page. Okay. So filled with fertilized eggs. Okay. This is what you see like in your cat and your dog that actually drop off. And they might actually be present near their anus. And they look like little grains of rice. And they can actually move. That is weird. But they actually have muscles. And they can stay in the soil for very long periods of time. And then eventually, they could be eaten by the secondary host. So we're going to talk about one of the characteristics of these endoparasites is they have these compl complicated life cycles. So let's look at an example of a tapeworm life cycle. So tapeworms can be in humans. We can get them from pigs, undercooked meat pig. We can get them from pork, a pig, right? Or we can get them from fish. I guess any, we could get them probably from any um, grazing animal. 
but we have an interesting life cycle when it comes to cats and dogs. And I think that that is important because especially with us, we have lots of cats and dogs in our environment. And it's important that we get them dewormed for a variety of reasons. So let's talk about the life cycle of the cat tapeworm. This can actually be found on the Center for Disease Control website because we could actually get cat or dog tapeworms ourselves in a couple of different ways. Okay, this one is very interesting because it has an unusual, what you might not think of in this case, uh, the most common tapeworm, secondary host. Okay, so the adult resides in the cat's digestive system. There, it is producing lots of proglottids, lots of packets of eggs, and those eggs are traveling out. So the eggs leave via the feces. This is very common, especially if we're talking about digestive system endoparasites, right? We need to get those eggs out so that they can get into a new host. That makes sense, okay? These in cats oftentimes are picked up by not mice, but fleas. So they are eaten by fleas. And then they embed, the larvae are in the fleas. They embed in the skeletal muscle of the fleas. The cat is licking itself, it's biting at its fleas, right? and it ingests, right? It could get another tapeworm. It could get fleas from another animal, right? So we could get the larva being eaten by a cat, so, or the flea, right? Flea eaten by another cat, let's say. Okay. So this is also why they want you to treat your animals for fleas, as well as pick up animal feces on a regular basis. <laughs> Same thing with dogs. This could be a problem with dogs as well. So a couple of different ways that this tapeworm could get inside us, we could actually accidentally eat a flea. How could that happen? Well, if you're talking about a dog, the dog could lick your face, right? Children tend to be around near the ground where fleas might be found near their animals, they could get licked, right? You could get a flea transferred to your mouth. And then notice that the parasite would actually be in the wrong host if that was the case, because it needs to be in the host that is gonna be eaten. And so this is a way that you could actually get the larvae embedding in your different organs, which could be a very bad thing. It could embed in your muscles, but it could also embed in your heart, maybe even in your brain, okay. You could also, you know, I am so confused and I gotta stop. <laughs>